start tonight with a word of encouragement to this band of brothers and sisters that are dedicated to spreading the gospel in this community and around the world. December 5 is the slogan used by the Marines. It means faithful always. It underscores fidelity to a mission. And our mission living in this world is actually more difficult than any Marine ever faced. Changing the hearts and souls of people to bring them into submission to Jesus Christ. Where is the magic bullet that will accomplish this? Remember how Noah preached 120 years and how he convinced seven people and they were his own relatives. He could not find a magic bullet that would make the message of God non-offensive to people. God designed the truth in such a way that it is compelling, it is magnetic when there's a heart deeply burning and searching above all things to find out the truth about God and His way of salvation. When you have that kind of heart and the truth confronts that heart, it works like a magnet and nothing can defeat it. What makes our, our challenge so difficult that deep in the hearts of men there is loyalty to human traditions, to sins that have been practiced for a long time, to religions that have been passed down generation after generation. Think about the master teacher himself the content and the manner of his teaching was perfect to the letter. And yet the religious leaders were so offended by what he taught, they were able to deceive the people and they were offended so that in a, as a, a whole they cried out, crucify this man, we're not listening to him anymore. Where is that magic bullet that would make our message unoffensive to people, and they would just flock to the gospel. And it doesn't exist, and hence the difficulty that we have in meeting this challenge. Think of how the apostles were stoned and driven out of town after town. Did they make a mistake? Did they miss the magic bullet that could have made their preaching less sharp and knock the rough edges off of it, and it would be appealing to people? There was no such magic bullet. Because the gospel confronts sin and deep-rooted error in the hearts of people. And yet, when there is that burning desire, let me tell you a painful way that I've learned something about that lesson. When I was a young man, my, mo my mother's mother, my grandmother, a very sweet lady, was in a religion that you can't read about in the Bible that does not teach the necessity of submitting to Christ in baptism for the remission of sin. And I tried several times to talk to my grandmother. I loved her dearly. You heard me say the other night I grew up in a home where I suffered abuse, and when I was in her home, I was always perfectly safe. I loved her, and I loved her. And I thought one day I had found the magic bullet. I knew she was not aware that 1 Peter 3.21 says baptism saves us. And I thought, now all I've got to do is approach her in the right way and she will be convinced. <laughs> I still can remember, I was maybe 12 or 14, she was standing at the sink cleaning dishes. Her last name was Friend, we called her Mama Friend. I said, Mama Friend, if I were ever to find a verse in the Bible that says baptism saves us, would you believe it then? I knew that was the magic bullet. She set her jaw in a way that she could do and said, I don't want to see it. It flustered me. It crushed me. But over the years, I learned to look back on that and to draw a lesson from it. Even though she was perfectly honest at many levels, and such a loving, tender, caring person, somewhere deep in her soul, there was a commitment to religious traditions that are not in line with what God teaches, 
And she had no intention of changing her commitment to those traditions. Now, I know from speaking to some of you that you've come from a background of immorality and religious era, and you have worked and found your way to the truth, and here's the difference. <clears throat> it's not that somebody had a magic bullet. It's not that somebody had a perfectly unoffensive way to approach you. It's the fact that your heart was burning so deeply to find the truth of God's Word. And when confronted with that truth, the heart goes like a magnet to that Word. And so my word of encouragement simplified. Be faithful to the mission that you're committed to. Keep preaching and preaching. There's no magic bullet. We're not going to find a way to preach an inoffensive message. The message of the gospel is offensive to sin. But just be patient. And be as kind as you can, but keep putting the truth out there. Do not become tired. Do not become discouraged. Do not become frustrated. Just stay on target. God bless you in the work that you've done for many years. And God bless you in the work you'll do in the future years. Thank you for your hospitality. The deans have been so gracious to us and enjoyed being with John and Lauren again tonight. Appreciate gospel preachers being here, standing here again, and Brother Gail told, and that's encouraging. But above all, our visitors give us encouragement. Thank you for being here tonight. When the lesson ends, we open the floor so that you can ask questions. If I say something not clear, please ask. If I say something you don't agree with, yes, the floor is open. We're here as friends to study, and you're perfectly free to ask about it. So if you think of something, let me know, and we will have that open forum time. Our theme this week, we've been studying what it means to be a Christian. And so I call your attention now to the prison of sin. To be a Christian means we have a get-out-of-jail card. We get out of the prison of sin. 1 Peter 3 and verse 19. Sin is a prison to the soul of man. The verse says, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. The spirits in prison. I want to study about that. It was referring to the people in the time of Noah who lived a life of disobedience in the prison of sin. They lived in sin and they died in sin and they were yet in the prison of sin when Peter wrote this letter. Satan offers sin as so attractive, it'll be the greatest blessing you've ever had. It reminds me of a kidnapper moving through a community looking for little children. Would you like to have a piece of candy? Oh my, children love candy, so they're drawn to it. And they don't understand what's about to happen. And we don't have a clue what's about to happen when we cross that line and commit sin before Almighty God. Satan has now taken us, kidnapped us, you know, the child that's kidnapped doesn't realize he's about to be separated from his family. And we have no clue that when we cross that line and commit sin, our fellowship with God is broken. Irreparably broken. We won't be able to go home. The man that kidnaps a child like that sometimes is very abusive. And Satan is always abusive. He's a harsh slave master. He enslaves our souls to sin so that we don't know how to escape. And actually, just like the child cannot escape, we can't either. We're now caught and held in the prison of sin never to escape. We live in sin, we die in sin, and we will spend eternity in a devil's hell. That's what lies before us. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. There is good news. God sent Jesus Christ to free us from the prison of sin, to open the doors and let us out. And we're going to study how the gospel frees us from the prison. Number two, we will not go back to this prison. We will never go back. And last, I want to study that Christ makes us free so that we may learn how to serve God and even to serve each other. It's a new life and a beautiful life. Christ can make us free, but when? When? 
right now, right here, tonight, any time, any place that we will yield our souls to the Lord, Christ can make us free from the prison of sin. Tonight we study verse by verse. We won't be moving around very much, so if you have a Bible, you can open to 1 Peter 3. And let's study 18 to 22 beginning. And let's read about how the gospel makes us free from sin. You know, often when there's kidnapping, there's a ransom demanded. If you pay the ransom, the child is released. Jesus Christ paid the price, the ransom, to free us from the clutches of Satan. And so what we read in the 18th verse is this. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit. When I read in that verse, the just died. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ, of course. When I read the just died for the unjust, who is that? All I need do is look in a mirror, and I'll know the answer to that. He is the holy one, we are the unholy ones. He is the just ones, we are the unjust ones. And it is amazing, it's almost incredible, that the Holy Son of God would die for me, an unholy, sinful, rebellious man. And that's the amazing grace of God. And notice the Bible said he offered that sacrifice how many times? The Bible said once. The Divine Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words is just a book that defines Greek words and gives the English meaning. That word means once for all. Something of perpetual validity. Perpetual. Not requiring repetition. In the Old Testament time, before Christ offered the perfect sacrifice, they offered thousands upon thousands of animal sacrifices that could never take away sin. Now they had a purpose in God's plan of pointing and leading the people to Christ who would offer the perfect sacrifice. But think how we're blessed. We're not required to bring thousands upon thousands of animals. We simply look to Jesus Christ who offered one perfect sacrifice for all men for all times, and that included my sins and your sins. How blessed we are. Put to death in the flesh, but he arose by the Spirit. And let's see how God's patience and judgment are illustrated in the time of Noah. Verses 19 to 20. This passage is going to underscore the patience, the long-suffering of God. By which, the pronoun which, going back to the Holy Spirit mentioned in the previous verse, by which also He, pronoun going back to Jesus Christ, He went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now when did Christ through the Spirit preach to the spirits in prison? For people who've come up with all kinds of convoluted theories about how that, well, when Jesus died, he went down in the Hades world and preached to all the sinners. To what purpose? When we enter the Hades world, we cannot repent. When we die, the door is closed. There's no more preaching. So let's come back to the passage and notice the context. The spirits in prison keep reading. The verses, remember, were added later. And it just helps us find our place. But actually in the original, there's no verses. So unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when? When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So, think about this. It shows the glory of God that he showed such patience to mankind. Noah was building that ark 120 years, and through all of those years, he was preaching. 2 Peter chapter 2 said he was a preacher of righteousness. And 
And let me tell you, he couldn't find that magic bullet either, any more than we could. He did not find some inoffensive message. He preached straight to the people about their sins and how they must repent and how the day was coming of a terrible judgment and they must enter the ark that God had commanded him to build. Preaching and building, building and preaching. That ark was an object lesson that God is a God of judgment. And judgment is surely coming. And I admire the fidelity of this man. You talk about Semper Fi preaching 120 years and only convincing seven people and those were his own family. Well, notice this. How many arcs did God tell him to build? One ark. So he preached there was one ark of safety. There was one and only means to be delivered from the coming judgment of God. God did not allow him to build that ark by his wisdom and to design his own pattern for an ark. You go back to Genesis 6 and God specified how to build that ark. You read that pattern that God gave. And then let's understand something. There was no other hope for a lost world. To be delivered from the coming judgment of the worldwide flood, every person must enter this one ark. Can you understand that would be offensive to many people? What in the world is the matter with you, sir, preaching that we can only be delivered by God in one way? Well, our God is a loving God. Our God is a God of grace. How can you insist there's only one way for a man to be right with God? Noah just patiently preached it. Now, most of the people ignored it. What's that old man preaching about up there? Don't pay any attention to him. we got places to go and things to do. Can you not imagine how they would have mocked at him? Hey, old man, I see the ark, but I can't see the water. Where's the water, old man? Yeah, you can well imagine how they made a mockery out of him. And they rejected his preaching. By doing that, they rejected God's plan. And there was no magic bullet by which he could change that reality and that result. It still crushes my heart when I read this, I guess partly because I am a preacher. I understand what it is to pour out your heart to people. Try to show them the love of God. Try to convince them to obey God and to repent. And we go for months and months and we barely can baptize somebody. But listen, think about 120 years of pouring out your heart and you don't convince anybody outside your own family. If our hearts are crushed to think about people we know and love that don't obey the gospel, what about the thousands upon thousands that drowned in that flood who did not obey the message of God? It ought to touch our hearts. It ought to crush our hearts. Very few will actually open their heart and yield those long-held traditions, religions, practices, sins that they're wedded to and they're simply not going to yield to God. It's a tragic story. But the point here is the patience of God waiting to try to reach one more soul. And by the way, that's why we're alive tonight, literally. The reason God lets the universe continue is in the hope of reaching one more soul. And that one might be in this audience tonight. Who knows? Now notice how that then. Peter brings the application to our time by teaching that we must submit to Christ in baptism. Let's read verses 21 and 22. This passage shows that a penitent believer must submit to Christ in baptism, and by that obedient faith, we lay hold upon the perfect sacrifice that Jesus gave to wash away our sins. Verse 21, now having referred to the ark was lifted up by the water. The same water that drowned the sinners lifted the ark 
So in that sense, Noah was saved by the water that lifted the ark. Verse 21, the like figure where unto, even baptism, doth also now save us. Now he made a clarification. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. So it's not like jumping in your bathtub to wash the mud off of your body, but it's for the sake of the conscience to be clean with God, to have your sins forgiven. And then he makes another clarification, it's not because of any magic in the water. It is by what power? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Savior who died for us and made that one perfect sacrifice in verse 18. It's the same Savior that conquered death, came out of the grave. And it is by the power of the resurrected Lord. Our sins are forgiven when we submit to Him in water baptism by obedient faith. Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him. Truly He is Lord of lords and King of kings. He rules over all the universe, over all nations of men. He rules to bring us unto salvation. Notice the parallels to the previous passage. God waited while Noah was preaching and building the ark, and God is waiting while we're preaching the gospel. And God bless you. I pray God will continue to bless you in this congregation as you're doing that work. Not only this week, day in, day out. We must continue doing this work and not fail the patience of God. Have you thought about that? If we fail in this work, we get tired, we get frustrated, we get disappointed, and so we're just going to give up. We fail the patience of God. We fail His purpose for extending time. He's giving that time that we may preach, and I don't mean just in a pulpit. I mean in your daily lives. You're doing that work of holding forth the gospel of Christ to a lost world. How many arts did God teach Noah to build? Just one ark. Now how many ways does God offer salvation today? Just one way of salvation. And it's by God's pattern. It's not by our philosophy. It's not by what some theologians thought we should do. It's not by what some philosophers might recommend we do. It's by the exact pattern given in the New Testament by Almighty God. Now this comes as offensive to people whose hearts are not burning and seeking for the truth to say there's no other hope, no other way to God, only strictly through this one gospel of Christ. How dare you be so arrogant? How could you say such a thing? Our God is a loving God, a God of grace. Yes, He's a loving God and a God of grace, but there's still just one heart. There's just one way of salvation. And yes, that offends our sinful hearts, but we've got to yield our sinful hearts. We must yield our sinful hearts. We pour out our hearts, we spend money, we travel, I know many of you have knocked on doors, you've given tracts, you've spoken to your relatives, you've exhausted yourself trying to find someone that would be interested in the truth, and we find men ignore us again, again, and again. Is it any different from Noah's time? Are we going to find the magic bullet that will solve all of that? We're not. But we're not going to stop working either. And do people mock? Do people mock at some of us? Oh, you believe in water salvation. No, we do not believe in water salvation. We believe in salvation through the one perfect sacrifice. But the issue is, will you submit and enter the ark? Will you submit to God's plan for receiving the sacrifice? We will be saved by the resurrected Savior. There's no magic in the water. There's no water salvation, it's in Christ. But the mockery goes on. People talk about the Church of Christ being a cult. What is a cult? 
Well, it doesn't agree with our religious traditions. That's why it's a cult. No, wait a minute. A cult has some obsessive human leader that presents himself as the salvation. We don't have anybody like that in the churches of Christ. Jesus Christ is the only Savior. A cult will demand that you yield all of your possessions under the power of that human leader. In the Church of Christ, we give into the treasury on the first day of the week by the teaching of 1 Corinthians 16, and decisions are made by the congregation to use that treasury in preaching the gospel. There is no one man that has his fist on the money and he buys airplanes and beautiful cars and big mansions to live in. The Church of Christ is not a cult. But it doesn't stop people from repeating this. It seems like a cult because we're not teaching the long-held traditions in the religious world at large. And so did men reject God's plan when Noah built an ark? And was there a magic bullet that could change that if Noah had just smiled the right way? There wasn't. We need to be prepared for the painful reality that most people are going to reject the gospel of Christ that we're preaching. By so doing, they're rejecting God's only plan for their salvation. But there are few <coughs> that will yield. And that's why we dare not fail the patience of God. We're looking for those few. And they are still there. Some of you came to Christ one of the few. Many, of course, in this audience have done that. So there are parallels there. Now before we move to the next paragraph, N-O-W or N-O-T. <coughs> Satan is very bold without changing the Word of God. He's deceiving people by doing that. Let's go back to the garden when God said there was a forbidden tree and in the day you eat thereof you shall surely die, Genesis 2.17. And here comes Satan. He knows how to smile. He knows how to make the message sound pleasing and inoffensive and attractive. You shall not surely die. What did he add? In old Not afraid to contradict the word of God just want you to know that's how he works. He deceives us in that way. Let me make a modern application of this danger. Romans 1.26 speaks of homosexuality. It is against nature. It is unnatural. One of the presidential candidates recently announced that God made him a homosexual and he's proud of it. In other words, it is not against nature. That's Satan speaking. Do you see that? And he's deceiving people with that. Satan is brazen. It doesn't matter how simple, how loving, how clear is the Word of God. Satan is not afraid to say not to whatever the Word of God says. So in the verse we're studying right now, 1 Peter 3, 21, baptism doth also N-O-W now save us. Could that be any clearer? And Satan is not hesitant for a moment to spread the religious concept. Baptism does N-O-T not save us. I mentioned the other night when I was preaching in a very remote place in the Philippines, a fellow walked by the dirt road and went into the hut to listen. I was discussing that verse, 1 Peter 3, 21. And the man stayed because he heard the simplicity of just preaching that it means exactly what it said. We must submit to Christ in baptism to receive forgiveness of our sins. He was baptized at 5 o'clock the next morning because he continued to study all night with our brethren. And he said what started him on that study, he read this verse for himself. He took a day off from work and visited five denominational preachers just sincerely asking, Sir, please explain this verse. And every one of them tried to explain it that it means baptism does not save us. And the man was still 
struggling and searching, but he knew there's something not right about that explanation. It says baptism does now save us. And when he heard there are people that preach, it does mean that. It means just what it says. And that's the one hope of salvation. It wasn't long until he was convinced. Now why is he convinced? And my grandmother was not. And people that you love as much as I love my grandmother are not convinced. Is it because we're too sharp and offensive in our preaching? No. No, the difference is simply this. There are hearts burning so deeply to seek for the truth, they would take a day off from work and go ask five preachers to explain a verse. Do you see how that man's heart was burning? And my grandmother did not have that burning heart. She didn't have any curiosity. No, such a verse was there. No, I don't want to see it. And that pains me to even say that because I loved her so much. But I'm just trying to help you see why we have different reactions. Do not be deceived when Satan adds the word N-O-T. It may contradict what you've heard all your life from religious teachers and leaders and famous preachers. But read your Bible. It's right. It's true. And no preacher, no tradition can change the Word of God. And so remember, that resurrected Savior is gone into heaven. We're talking about the Word of the One who is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We must submit to Him. We must in all things. Even after our baptism, we must continue a life of submitting to Him. He is the only Savior. He is the only hope for a home in heaven. But let's read a few more verses in chapter 4, 1 to 7. We will not go back to the prison of sin. When we leave this life of sin, we want to learn to obey the will of God. We must be deeply committed, willing to pay any price, willing to suffer any trial, willing to endure rejection from our own family circle and loved ones, because that happens sometimes. Verses 1 and 2. We must suffer just as Christ suffered, so that we overcome sin. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. And he's talking about a willingness to suffer. He was willing to go to the cross. Now here's what we must learn. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the lust of the flesh, uh, in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Now, to cease from sin. A strong word. Again, from the Greek English lexicon, it means to cease, to desist, to get released from your sins. No longer stirred by the incitements and seductions of sin. No longer drawn to my sin. No longer defending my sin. No longer in love with my sin. I cease. <clears throat> but if I'm going to do that, I will suffer. Now, why would I have to suffer? Because Satan is vicious and malicious and unrelenting and he will see that you suffer to bring you back to the prison of sin. So we have to be locked in from the moment that we're baptized to know, get ready for the suffering, here it comes. Satan does not lose a customer easily. And we will suffer. We're not ashamed of that. Christ was not ashamed to suffer for us. Why should we be ashamed when men bring suffering to us, when Satan brings suffering into our lives? Christ suffered so that we can win this battle against sin. And if we will be faithful to Christ and not ashamed to suffer, we will win this battle with sin. But we've wasted our past days living in sin. Verse 3. For the time past of our life may suffice us. Suffice is like saying enough was enough. 
to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, ungodly people, we lived an ungodly life. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excessive wine, reveling, banqueting, and abominable idolatries. So he gave some examples. That's not an exhaustive list. Not exhaustive, but representative of many sins in our past life. Take a moment and reflect on those words that identify certain sins. Some sins are lascivious in nature. A life of debauchery, sensuality, shameless living. This lascivious is to stir up unlawful sexual desires. Our sexual nature is holy, clean, and pure, created by God to be shared in marriage. One man or one woman for life. But having sexual desires and practices outside of the bonds of marriage is lascivious. In other words, lewdness. And so it would identify such things as pornography, lewd dancing, and songs. In other words, we don't need to be on the dance floor holding some woman or having her gyrate her body so that we can watch. We don't need to be using filthy talk. That's lascivious language. We don't need to participate in immodest dress. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned and they had a sense of shame and they put on that little apron garment that covered their waist down to maybe the middle of their thigh. It just covered their private parts basically. But remember it wasn't sufficient clothing and God gave coats or tunics <coughs> A garment that covers the shoulders, the upper torso. It covers your waist and your private parts. It covers your thighs down to your knees. God created that appropriate, modest dress. When we start uncovering what God covered, that's lasciviousness. And so in our time, the styles constantly are finding ways to uncover what God covered. So we have sleeveless, open shoulders, backless dresses, plunging neckline. We have dresses that crawl up instead of covering down. And then someone will say, well, you preachers just don't understand that fashions change. Well, it's not wrong that fashions change. We can wear clothes with different colors and different designs, and there's no sin in that. But we don't need to keep uncovering parts of the body. That's not only an issue of fashion, that goes into the realm of being immodest. Amen. That's lascivious conduct. And we have left that life behind. And as we give our children guidance, by the way, they're teenagers, we don't let them go out in this lascivious dress. Not even for athletics or any other activity. The passage said we live that kind of life enough when we live in our sin. Well, he said lust. He used a broad word. Passions at large. All sorts of uncontrolled desires. Lacking restraint. It might be in speech. It might be in conduct. There are people that are obsessed with money and it becomes their passion, their God. That's a sinful lifestyle. There are people obsessed with sex, and it becomes their passion and shapes their lifestyle. You have fornication, you have adultery, you have homosexuality, and they know no boundaries. You have people obsessed with getting power. They will lie and cheat. And even in the Philippines, there are constant assassinations in the political disagreements they have. The obsession with power <coughs> be abusing our family because we don't control our temper. The Bible is saying, close that chapter. That is finished. Start a new life. Not that old life. Excess of wine is drunken debauchery. It's what we would call an alcoholic. Revelings. It still speaks of drinking alcohol, but not somebody that's an alcoholic. It's somebody that lives the party life. Feasting and drinking into the night, this American expression, wine, women, and song, perfectly captures this Greek word, revelings. 
This is an ungodly lifestyle. We close that chapter when we submit to Christ. A third word that refers to drinking alcohol in the King James, it says banquetings. It just means drinking parties, but not necessarily late in the night. Sipping the wine, having a cocktail, just a few beers with my buddies. R.C. Trench and synonyms of the New Testament explaining differences in synonyms in the Greek language. It said this word means drinking not of necessity excessive. Why is it a sin if it's not of necessity excessive? Because alcohol begins the process of intoxication from the first drink. And so the Bible said, drinking alcohol belongs to the old life. We're finished with that lot. And then abominable diet of idolatry. It's referring to the fact that many vices were associated with the worship of idols. They have drunken feasts, but even would have sex as an honor to the idols with prostitutes, even homosexual prostitutes. They had orgies. Uh, it was a very vice-filled way to worship, and it attracted people by the thousands. Now, one thing before I leave this, sometimes there are even Christians who have the mistaken notion, often sincere, but they think if I don't drink hard liquor, I just have a beer down there, and I just have my glass of wine, there won't be anything wrong with that. The problem is, there is the same amount of alcohol in the average glass of beer, or glass of wine, or shot of liquor. Same amount of alcohol. So if you can drink the beer, you just as well go ahead and drink the hard liquor too. And again, just to understand how Satan uses that, when I drink the alcohol, it goes into my stomach. My blood circulates through my body, and the alcohol immediately is absorbed into my blood. My bloodstream goes to my brain. From the first drink, alcohol is going to my brain. No, I'm not falling down drunk but there's a chemical reaction that you cannot stop. It begins to affect your judgment. I used to teach driver education in high school. A driver education book will tell you there is no safe amount of alcohol before you get in a car. Now, people can understand that in a secular context. We can understand that in a spiritual context. The danger there is making poor decisions in driving. Danger here is making poor decisions that will affect my life before God and my salvation. So I don't need to give Satan that leverage, that opportunity. Close that chapter of life. Now, when you make this commitment to Christ, many people still living in the prison of sin cannot understand this. Verses 4 to 5. They will be shocked and even offended. Verse 4, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. There's a God who will judge all men who are living and the dead on the last day. And what he's saying is there are people who don't think of that judgment. They're committed to this sinful lifestyle. And when you get out of that lifestyle, you seem like an odd ball. You're the odd man out. And so because they think it's strange, they're going to criticize you, maybe start rumors, make cutting remarks. And here's one of the reasons. That new life you live will cut the conscience of many people who somewhere deep down know the life they're living is not right. So when you make the change, it's a highly offensive to them. Because it's putting them in shame. They will scorn you, penalize you, and abuse you for a simple reason. It's an effort to exercise pressure so that you begin to feel ashamed. And you will fall back to the old practices of sin. 
We should know how our enemy works, and this is how Satan works. If you obey the gospel, it's not an easy life. When you try to convert others, it's not an easy challenge. And so the writer started the chapter by saying, Christ suffered much to open this way of salvation. If you step into this way of salvation, what should you expect? You will suffer. And just be prepared for it and don't be ashamed of it. But we won't yield to that pressure. The gospel is calling us so that we prepare for the judgment that's coming. Let's read in verses 6 to 7. We're preparing for judgment. For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. Remember last night in the open forum, someone asked about 1 Corinthians 15, 29, baptism for the dead. And I was showing that in the context, that's referring not to baptizing people that are alive so they will be saved on behalf of dead people so that the dead will be saved, I should have said. But what it was discussing, the dead in Christ. People who have died in Christ. We're baptized for the same hope they had. This passage is talking about that same principle. The gospel was preached to those that are dead, referring to Christians who have died, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. Now the brethren who died ahead of us and died faithfully, <laughs> did they suffer trials and abuse? They did, but they were faithful. So we're supposed to be listening and learning from that. Judge according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. You see how they were not ashamed? They were alive to God, though men condemned them. But they died faithful. And verse 7 then gives this warning, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. Those faithful Christians died knowing the end will soon enough come. And they were faithful. Let us do the same thing they did. Now what does he mean the end is near? He doesn't mean that there's some chart to give a date for the coming of the Lord. When you start Bible history, you meet the patriarchs. Who are they? Men like Adam, Noah, and Abraham and all of those men, that's the patriarchal age in Bible history. Now following that, God gave the law of Moses at Mount Sinai. It started a new period of Bible history. The Mosaic age <coughs> under the law of Moses. Now finally, Christ came and he sent the Holy Spirit to reveal the complete gospel which has been written in the New Testament. So we call it the gospel age or the Christian age. What is the next age? There's not a next age. Folks, this is the last time. We live in the last days. From the day of Pentecost to the end of time is the last day. And that's why we have to be prepared. We know not the day or the hour that Jesus will return. So let's live like it. Let's live as if today is the last day. Because it may be. We live in the last time. Then, one more important thing. When we are made free from the prison of sin, we're not being made free to go back to our sins, but to learn how to live a new life serving God and each other. Let's read about this beginning in verse 8 to 11. We're going to learn how to live a new life defined by unselfish love. Verses 8 and 9. Let's read it. Above all things... Have fervent charity among yourselves. Charity means active love. For charity shall cover the multitude of sin. That means to have a forgiving spirit. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Now what's this new life? In the old life of sin, how does Satan teach us to live? We use other people. We lie to them, we borrow money from them, don't pay it back. We let them pay for the drinks as long as they'll pay for the drinks. We manipulate other people to get what we want. We even abuse other people. 
It's all for selfish purposes. When we begin this new life in Christ, you won't see that anymore. This is a new life defined by unselfish love. We learn how to become servants one to another. We learn a spirit of forgiveness, not a spirit of retaliation. We don't learn how to hold grudges and bitterness in our hearts. We learn how to share what we have with joy. Spirit of hospitality. We open our homes. We share what we have. And it's without grudging. It's a happy, joyous life. Learning how to love and serve each other. What a beautiful new life. And in that new life, we learn how to use our talents as stewards of God. Let's read verse 10 to 11. We're going to learn to use our gifts to the glory of God. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Every new Christian is endowed with talents. And God will put those talents to use if we will submit those talents to Him. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, that's not referring now to preaching, but it just means serving others. Let him do it as of the ability which God gives. And there are many gifts that accomplish that. <laughs> that God in all things may be glorified for Jesus Christ, to whom be praised and dominion forever and ever. When I read that passage, I think about going into the Villabit prison in the metro Manila area. It's the national prison of the Philippines. It was designed to hold about 7,000 inmates. There are about 21 or 22,000 inmates when I was preaching in there one time, a brother that had been baptized told me, if I get up in the night to go urinate, when I come back, the place where I was laying was taken by somebody else. And when I preach to these men, I often refer to this passage or similar passages to tell them this. Yes, you've made some wrong turns, and this brought you to where you are. But you have talents given by God. And those talents are useful to God. And you don't need to be ashamed and defeated and to give up on your life. You can learn how to use your talents in serving God. And I want to say the same thing here tonight. These young people up at the very front row have talents given by God. And if they'll serve God, they'll, they'll learn about those talents and how to use it all the way to the back of this auditorium, man and woman, young and old. Think how many of us are here, it's not a huge audience, but how many talents are in this audience? That would be a huge number, because we have multiple talents. God knows what they are, and how to help you learn to use them. Now since our talents are gifts of God, we should use those and use them in an humble way to serve. I don't need to compare my talents to yours. You don't need to compare your talents to someone else's. I just need to figure out what talents I have and use them. They are gifts of God. And that's what you need to do. Now when it's said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, because some have a gift of preaching and teaching. I don't know how we received any of these gifts. It's just God's providence. How did I receive a gift to preach? I don't have an answer for that. But what the Bible is telling me, if you have a talent for that, don't get up and spout a bunch of human philosophy. Don't do a lot of pop psychology. Don't get up and entertain the people so they're laughing one minute and falling in the aisle and they're crying the next minute and it's just all emotional entertainment. Speak as the oracles of God. And this Bible constitutes the oracles of God, <coughs> divine revelation. We should be speaking exactly like the Bible speaks, be very silent where the Bible is silent. Strictly adhere to the original teaching in the Bible. 
But now notice that part that says that God may be glorified. The gift I have is not superior to the gift that Elijah has to lead singing tonight. And the gift the two of us have is not superior to the gifts that widow ladies in this church have. God needs all of us with our gifts, our energies. We need to be good stewards so that we will use these gifts as He directs and God will be the one glorified. Amen. That's the new law when we get out of the prison of sin. Because sin is a prison. Just as surely as a child is kidnapped by a malicious kidnapper, Satan kidnaps us and controls us and separates us from the love of God and enslaves us in our sins. And we cannot escape by our own power and wisdom. But the good news, God sent Christ into this world to open the prison doors, to let us out from the prison of sin. How does he do it? The gospel of Christ is the means that he uses to release us from sin. When we get out of the prison, let's make a firm commitment. We will never go back. We will never go back. We will keep learning and growing. We may stumble, but we're never going back to that prison. We're going to repent when we stumble and just keep learning and growing. And remember, we're made free not to go back, but to learn how to use our talents to serve God to the glory of God. Your friend Christ can make us free right here, right now, tonight, if you're willing. Sinners in the world need to put their faith in Christ, the crucified and risen Savior. We must repent of every sin, confess His name, and submit to Him in baptism. Because the Bible said, Baptism doth also in O W now save us. We must submit to Christ, who is gone into heaven, the resurrected Lord, and He is ready to forgive our sins. Break with those traditions of the past. Break with those sins that hold you. And bring your sins to the cross of Jesus Christ. Why not do it tonight? There may be Christians present who have fallen back into sin. We need to repent of those things and confess them. And the Bible teaches when we pray we can be forgiven. 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A loving, patient God extended time and opportunity right here tonight to give us the, the chance again to think about our soul's salvation and to think about the hope of heaven. If you need to obey the gospel, my friend, we plead with you, come tonight. Step in the aisle and come forward as we stand and sing this song. Thank you. Please be seated. My patient, committed audience we've had tonight, truly I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving your time and attention well to the study. I hope we've studied something that will help us go to heaven in the end. We're shifting from a pulpit format, and it's like a Bible class format like an open forum, where we can put questions on the table, even objections on the table. I know there are religious groups that would make you uncomfortable to question a preacher. We don't share that philosophy. It's healthy to question people. We do that in a good spirit. It helps us learn. It helps us grow. And if you were to help me correct something, I would be thankful for it. So seriously, we want the floor open to our members and our visitors. Any question? will be welcome tonight. We've had several good questions through the week. Anyone now that would like to ask a question? May, okay. So you, you clearly used 1 Peter 3.21 for baptism tonight. What other passages might you focus on to use for the same thing? Okay. Something that would shed more light on that. Let's go back to Mark 16. 
verses 15 and 16. When the crucified Savior arose from the dead, if you read the 16th chapter, it explains it was very difficult for the disciples at first to realize that a dead man was alive. That's the main thrust of the chapter. Finally, they were convinced because he appeared to them several times. But before he went back to heaven, this is what he said in Mark 16, 15 to 16. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Now remember, when he says gospel, they've just been convinced that the crucified Savior is the risen Savior. That's what will be on their minds. You go and preach that to the whole world. Now next verse, He that believeth, believes what? That Jesus Christ was crucified for our sin, and he conquered death and arose believeth and is baptized and is a coordinating conjunction. It joins things of equal importance. So joined to faith, which occurs in the heart, he said there must be an action, baptism. The literal Greek word means to be put under the water. When they spoke of a ship sinking in the Mediterranean Sea, that's the word they used. Baptizo in Greek. All right, to be immersed. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So that's very close to the wording in 1 Peter 3. Baptized, saved. All right, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So he's underscoring the reality. There's only one Savior, one gospel, and one right way to be saved from our sins. Now I'll just give maybe this follow up. When these men that heard those words first preached the gospel, you just turn over a few pages to Acts chapter 2. So they heard him say that, and now let's see what did they do when they preached. In Acts chapter 2, it's similar to Mark 16. The thrust of the sermon is the crucified Savior is now risen. So he brings it to a conclusion in Acts 2.36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. <coughs> to know assuredly is to be fully convinced. In other words, to believe. You should believe the message of salvation. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were ashamed and said to Peter, to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, so no exception, just one way, by what authority? And he doesn't cite the authority of a pope or the president of some religious organization in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the authority for the remission of sin, washing away sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And maybe I'll close with this one. Acts 22, 16, there was a man that had been fighting against the truth. We know him as Saul. The man was on the road to Damascus to arrest Christians. And the Lord appeared to him in such a way as to convince him the crucified Savior is the risen Savior. How could he deny it when Christ appeared as the living Savior? So for three days, his heart was burdened with his sins. And he was even frightened. In Acts 22, 16, God sent a preacher to tell him this. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So we call on God to cleanse our conscience, when we submit to Christ in baptism. Now I might just add that the tradition that has made it hard for people to grasp this is a tradition that says they're saved by faith alone, before and without any act of obedience. And the undergirding principle is if you would submit in baptism, you're trying to be saved by works. And several times it says we can't be saved by our own works. 
Baptism is not an effort to be saved by our own works. The works of our life are the sins we commit. How would we be saved by others? But when we put our faith in Christ, it must be obedient faith. Not depending on your works, but simply depending on submission to Christ. And so this is not in conflict with the passages that say, we're saved by grace, not by works. This is the grace of God. It's through the blood of Christ that we are saved. But we must submit in baptism to receive that. Maybe that will help. Are there others? Anyone? Yeah, one. I have a question about that verse. Um, for many will be called, but few chosen. Is this pertaining to the people that do not obey the gospel, or also for Christians that have been saved and have walked away from the faith? All right, many are called. The gospel call goes out to men. When he said that, the problem was this. The religious leaders thought that they would lead the parade into the kingdom of God because they thought it was an earthly kingdom. Jesus was here calling them into his kingdom. But that is a spiritual kingdom for salvation. Very few are going to actually enter that true <coughs> kingdom for salvation. And that's the point that he's driving at. The call goes out to all, but very few <coughs> will actually enter. Now in other passages, those that enter must daily be on guard. Like we studied tonight, Satan will try viciously to pull us back into sin. So that's a real danger. But I don't think in this passage he was discussing that danger. In other passages he does. Okay? Anyone else? Okay. For those of us that have uh, family member and friends that are, that are men, and they don't live here, they live in other states. I'm a single woman, so to share the gospel with them and to share what we've covered, right. how do I make sure that I don't go into a teaching mode as if I'm trying to teach a man? Because okay. I know there's something in the scripture that women are not supposed to sure. teach me. I got your point. We'll go to that first. Thank you. Let's start in Matthew 28 <laughs> just for a moment. And we need to read in verse 19 to 20. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, or some of your translations, make disciples of all nations. But now how do we become a disciple of Christ? And how are we saved? Well again, baptizing them to the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. <coughs> now first when it said, make disciples or teach all nations, would that include male and female? I would say yes. I would say yes too. All nations is all people. Yes, sir. All right, so baptize them. The pronoun would go back to those same people. So it's male and female. Now verse 20. Teaching them. So again, male and female, all people, to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. <coughs> now he had commanded the you, the apostles, to go and teach all nations. So when you baptize people, teach them to do what? Go and make disciples in all nations. Male and female have the same responsibility to try to share the gospel with those that are lost. All right, that needs to be the first clear principle. Okay. Now the other part of your question would go to 1 Timothy chapter two. 1 Timothy 2. In the 8th verse, I will therefore that men, and that's a special Greek word that means males, 
pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubtings. In other words, when saints assemble, the males should be standing to lead the prayers, the songs, and so forth. And since he said holy hands, then in verses 9 through 11, he speaks of women also showing themselves to be holy by the modesty of their dress. And then verse 12, or 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. I will suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So in the assembly where males and females are gathered to worship, the men should take the lead. The women should not stand to lead prayers and songs and to preach because then they're taking authority over the men. So that's the only limitation. Okay. A woman should be very active to do her best to talk to her friends and relatives about the gospel, but she's not going to gather an assembly of men and women and stand up and preach or conduct a service. The men should learn to do that. All right? Thank you. Thank you.